It's not, of course, but it almost could be. Would you join me in prayer before we open up God's word? Father, as we bow before you, we again thank you for your presence with us. We thankful for the promise that wherever we gather, you are with us. We ask for your blessing as we look into your word. May you open our hearts so we see more of you, more of your greatness and your glory. May you bless us as we study and learn more of what evil is. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> well, this morning, obviously, we continue our study in the book of James. And as we do that, we are looking at James chapter 4, 1 through 6. And <clears throat> I hope that in your notes it says James 4. Begins, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? that war in your members. You lust and do not have. You murder and cover, co covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the devil, or resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I was almost adding my own commentary into that verse there. <coughs> we know we all face trials and temptations. And all too often we are prone to yield to things that look good. Some things even come from our own mind. This passage brings us to a new division in the book because we see the discussion now shifts to trials and temptations and how to conference, conquer them. Before we conquer them, we need to know what they are. And this passage lists four of them, and then the cure. So he begins with lust. What rages through us? The desire for gratification and for pleasure. Distrust, not fully trusting in God. Praying amiss, which is praying with the wrong motives. And worldliness which is too much friendship with this world. And point five is a brief glimpse into the cure. Now, this morning is not really a verse-by-verse -verse study, but kind of a study of the totality of all of these verses together. So we begin with lust. Where do wars and fights come from? Well, Occasionally, they come from the idea that somebody doesn't like the color of the church or doesn't like the color of the front. Have you ever noticed in here, by the way, when we think of color, that this is an accent wall? It's a different color than that one and that one and that one. I learned that when they painted it. Roxy shared it with me. She's back there shaking her head going, oh, just stop there. Um, but I learned this was an accent wall. She actually suggested that I get an accent wall in my office at one point in time, but um, that didn't happen because if I tried to take down everything in my office and make it paintable, it would not be good. But the wording here reflects our desire to ple for pleasure. It's anything that brings us pleasure, and that's the word lust here. Anything that gives us pleasure. It's a desire for something to the point that we fixate on it. That we have a war going on in ourselves about what we want to do and why we want to do it. We desire things and lust after things occasionally even though we know 
they are not good for us. We, if we would be honest with ourselves, we always would admit, or we could easily admit that occasionally we desire things that we know are not the best. Our desire is at, or our bodies are at war with ourselves and with God between our desire and God's desire. None of us is perfect. I just thought I'd share that right away. None of us is perfect. We all struggle with desires. I don't think there's anyone that is desire-free. Some desire money and all they can get. Some desire food and all they can get. Some power. And some, fill in your own blank right there. The second point we're going to look at is distrust. Not fully trusting in God. You don't have because you don't ask. We do not trust God enough to know that when we ask, He promises to answer. We need to know God in a personal way so that we can seek what he desires first. And that is a capital H on that, what he desires first. Because too many are willing to seek their own desires first. I'd like you to look at a passage that people don't like to be read sometimes. Romans 1. And we're going to begin in the middle of this passage titled God's Wrath and Righteousness. And we're going to Begin at 21 and read through 32. It begins, 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 wow. Um, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became fruitful in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creator rather, the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned with their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty for their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of all evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, and knowing the righteousness of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, but not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice men, practice them. John, 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We cannot be truly satisfied with what this world offers. People seek all kinds of things. People desire things to satisfy them. Too many will try this or that or that or this or anything to satisfy their desire. When the desire is truly satisfied when we know God, when we seek God's will first and let Him take care of the rest, that passage in Romans lists a whole lot of sins that people commit. And I'm sure it is not inclusive of every sin in the world. 
but there are people who commit those. And the part that gets me about it the most, and I, and I just have to share this with you, is the closing lines of that, where it says, and those that approve of what they're doing. That means that I would have to get up here and sanction something against God to say it's okay for you to do that. Well, you know what? Let me give you a hint. If God called it a sin 2,000 years ago, it's a sin today. And if God calls it a sin today, I have no right to stand up here and say, yeah, but you know, things have probably changed and God probably changed his mind and it's all okay. Do whatever you like. No. I can't do that. Because God doesn't change and his word doesn't change. And we have to stand for truth. And we have to be people who recognize that even though there's evil in this world, we cannot condone it. And we cannot say it's all right to do what makes you happy. Because it makes you happy. Well, you know what? There's a whole lot of things that can make us happy that are wrong. Because lots of things can make us happy for a minute. Lots of things can get us excited about things for a few moments. But then they fade. And we look for something else to take its place. The next point is praying amiss. Praying with the wrong motive. And this means praying the wrong way. Even believers, even true believers, can sometimes fall into this. We pray for ourselves rather than for the glory of God first. It is not wrong to pray for our needs. Jesus even taught his disciples to pray for bread when he said in his model prayer to them, give us this day our daily bread. Now, I'm going to tell you that this next little piece is direct quote from a sermon I gave, gave on James several years ago. Because when I was working on this, it struck me. And that is this. Jesus did not say, give us this day our daily Porsche and fill our bank account. There's a difference between praying for our needs, such as healing, and praying for our wants, such as more of something. If we desire something, let it be something that we can use to glorify God. Now, I'll share this with you. I think I could glorify great in a Porsche 911, okay? I think I could truly glorify God greatly driving around with that and waving at people. Um, God has not seen fit to let me do that yet, but I'm telling you, I think I would look really good doing that. Now, probably... That's a little more of me than of God. I just thought I'd share that with you. There's possibility there's a little more of me there. Um, but if either one of you, if anybody out here has one in their garage and you want to get rid of it, um, you can see me. Uh, but we need to make sure that what we have is for the glory of God. God is not against the rich. God is not against us having a bank account. He is against those who desire riches for riches' sake. That's it. If you desire riches because you want to be rich, there's a big difference than that, than saying, I desire to have something to bless other people with, to show my God how I can use that. We can want things. The rich young ruler, remember that story? He had much to give. He came to Jesus and, and he told Jesus, when Jesus told him to obey the commandments, hey, I've done it all. I've kept it. I, I, it's almost like he was saying, I am perfect. I've got this, Jesus. What, what more do I have to do? And Jesus, knowing his heart, went, give away what you've got. And then come follow me. And do you remember the wording? It says he went away sad because he had much. 
He knew what he was supposed to do. But he went away sad. Rather than saying, yes, Lord, it's yours. His heart was on that bank account, that money. And he walked away sad because he couldn't give it to the Lord. Matthew 6, 31 through 33 reads, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God, and let him do the blessing. Now, the next one is worldliness. And James uses strong words here. James is not politically correct here when he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. Using, used in this context, James is addressing the heart of the church, the heart of the people. Because remember, this book was written to the church, the believers. This is not a book written to the rest of the world. This is written to people just like us. James is telling them that they had left their first love and were chasing after other things. Too often we can be pulled by this world, the things that direct us and take us away from what God desires for us. The church is called the bride of Christ. Now, now speaking to married men in here for just a second, okay? To married men. You want your bride to be perfect, holy, pure. You want your bride to be, quite frankly, everything sometimes we fail to be. We want our brides to be great. No one goes to the altar and expects their bride to show up beating, beaten up and, you know. I, I've done a lot of weddings. I'll tell you, brides go to a lot great lengths to look really, really pretty. Brides don't show up generally with just whatever they happen to find in their closet to wear at their wedding. Now, it doesn't have to be a formal white dress, but generally brides show up looking pretty nice. Husbands love their wives. Wives love their husbands. It's supposed to be that way. Marriage is a husband and a wife together. And as they're doing this, as they come down, this comparison is used because it's the strongest comparison when God looked at James and said, this is how you're going to word this. To love like we love our spouses. To love Christ enough to die for him as he loved us enough to die for us. Spiritual adultery is not obeying the Lord. Spiritual adultery is worshiping other gods or other things before him. And you have to excuse me for just one second. One of the footballs rolled out from underneath the table, and I had to move it because I've been spending the last few minutes dodging it, and it was getting in my way. That's not part of the sermon. I'm just telling you that. <coughs> Spiritual adultery is putting anything, anything before God. Look at Hebrews 2.3 with me. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Spiritual adultery is being ashamed of Christ and his words. Mark 8.38 For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this 
adulterous and sinful generation. Of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus is talking about coming back here. But do we want to be people he would be ashamed of? I was talking with another pastor a week ago, and we got on the subject of where Jesus would be if he came back. If he just surprised everybody and just came back and started visiting places, where would he be? Would he show up with us and worship? You know, I think there's a lot of cases where he wouldn't be here. I think there are times that he would rather be in the rescue mission. You know, there's people there that needed him. You know, Scripture says Jesus was accused of eating and drinking with sinners. Okay, I'm going to surprise you. That means he might be comfortable here too. <laughs> because... I'm just sharing. I'm looking out, and I'm just sharing what little bit I know about some of you. I think he would probably be okay if he met with sinners, if he met with us. I know he certainly would be with me. We either serve God or Satan. Matthew 6.24 tells us that no man can serve two masters. We can't serve both. It's God or the other side. And if we try, if we try to serve both, um, <laughs> guess whose side we're going to be on? And it's not going to be God's. Now the last point is a cure. A brief glimpse into what we need to defeat temptation and trials. Verse 6 says, God gives more grace. God gives more grace. God will never leave those who are His. The Holy Spirit was sent by God years ago to indwell us, to be part of us. The Holy Spirit is very jealous for us. And this is a righteous jealousy. Because he desires the very best for us. It's not selfish. The Holy Spirit isn't indwelling us because he wants to be part of something that is different. He wants us to be part of something that is his. God desires us to have his grace and more of it. His, he desires us to come and to wholly, humbly ask for it. Grace is the favor and blessing of God. The person who turns to God and away from sin, away from the evil of this world, will get all the grace they ever need and then some. God does not forget or leave his people. When we celebrate communion, which we will do next Sunday, we see a guarantee that God has not forgotten us because he's telling us to remember his son's returning. We need to look for the cure to evil in this world and what God gives. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We come boldly to the throne. We are not arrogant when we come before the Father. We know who He is. You would not be arrogant if you approached the Queen of England. You would generally be very respectful of who she is. Longest reigning monarch ever from what I read. We would not be arrogant in front of her. We're not arrogant when we approach God. But we do come. We do approach God with a sense of boldness. Because he tells us to. 
He tells us to come before Him knowing that He is there. Knowing that He is listening. There's so much that we can do, but first we have to know the grace and love of God. When we know this, then God can equip us to not only defeat the darts of Satan, but be strong for his service. James knew too well what Satan can do, even among the believers. But he also knew that God is great, greater than Satan or any power or any tool that Satan can ever have. James was living in a time when the leaders of the church were being martyred. He knew what God could do, though. And he knew the power of his God. When we trust in first in God, let me read from you, or read to you, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do you notice it doesn't say trust in the Lord with all your heart but figure it out yourself. Do you notice it does not say acknowledge God but you know Work it out yourself. It is telling us who we rely on. There's a lot of uncertainty in this world. There's a lot of evil in this world. There's a lot of trouble in this world. But God's word still stands. And we need to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Not just a little bit of it but trust in Him with everything that we have. Acknowledge Him and let Him do the leading. We have a lot of promises from God and the fact that He will never leave us and never forsake us is the promise that we can hang on to even when the world around us is falling apart. This world may not know where to turn when there's a crisis, but we should. And that is the eternal, everlasting God who can guarantee us a place with Him forever. We are closing singing song 175, Standing on the Promises. We are singing verses 1 and 4. And I trust that you are truly standing on the promises that he provides. And one of those promises, by the way, <laughs> is there will be trials and troubles. That's a promise too. So as we stand and as we sing this, if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then I invite you today to make a decision for him. To choose life. To choose life eternal. And choose Jesus as Lord. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all and all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing.
standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Just as we got to the end of that song, I thought for a second I had not turned my microphone off and it scared me. Um, <laughs> Would you join me as we close? Father, thank you for the promises that we have from you. Thank you for who you are and for the truth that you impart unto all who know you. May you bless us as we seek to serve you, to know you more. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Hello.